For over 20 years, Kenji Gallo lived a life of crime. Being involved with the mafia, it's like being in a minefield. You always got to be careful. Until that life caught up with him. I was headed down a path where I would be killed or I'd be in prison for the rest of my life. Forcing him to make a deal with the FBI. In order for us as law enforcement to do our jobs, sometimes we have to make deals with the devil. It's 2004, and Kenny Kenji Gallo, a mob associate, is leading a double life. At this moment, Kenji is in a car with Colombo crime family capo, Teddy Persico Jr., on his way to murder Craig Marino, a Colombo soldier. Basically, the misconception about the mob is people think they're going to come into a place with their machine guns blazing. In real life, they get your best friend to lure you somewhere, and they shoot you in the back of the head. They get someone that you trust. And I, I know these guys. I know what they do. I was around for many, many years, and I know how they kill people. Kenji is wearing a wire as an FBI cooperating witness, but that doesn't ensure his safety. If he doesn't go through with the hit, then Persico will know that Kenji is a rat. Do I stop Teddy from killing Craig? What do I do? I can't leave. I'm going to get shot. These guys will kill you in one second. If I mess up, then I'm dead. Orange County, California, 1975. Not the obvious breeding ground for a modern day gangster. But from day one, Kenji stood out. I come from a middle class family, upper middle class, I guess. Irvine, California is like real vanilla. It's voted the safest city in America. I think I'm probably the worst thing that ever came out of there. My folks split up when I was in third grade, I believe 1976. I lived with my mom, and then she got remarried, and my stepdad and I didn't get along at all. They kept warning me that they're going to send me to military school, and they're going to send me to military school, and they finally did. Kenji's best friend from childhood, who accompanied him throughout his early life of drugs, crime, and violence, refuses to be identified for his own safety. Military school is where rich people send their juvenile delinquent sons instead of putting them into jail or psychiatric institutions. I'm small. I'm like a small kind of guy. And I just had a smart mouth, so the older guys would, would beat me up. Ken went there as a young boy. He's half Japanese. He was a little runt. And he immediately became terrorized by the older cadets. They would give you blanket parties if you mess up. They went to your sleep late at night. They come in and they throw a blanket over you and they beat you. There's a vicious knife scar on his hand. It's a number six. The top six cadets at the academy carved the number six into Kenji's hand. Ken realized it's better to kill than be killed. Soon, life lessons turned his focus to training. They taught him hand-to-hand -hand combat, the use of weapons, explosives, military tactics, and I think that's where they turned him into a criminal. In military school, a lot of kids smoked weed. I mean, there was marijuana around, alcohol, of course, because we were away. And then I even saw cocaine there. I did my first line there. He was probably 13 years old. His roommate showed him a tray of cocaine and said, hey, kid, snort this. He tried it, said, I like it. My friends were dealing when I was around him. Together, we all formed a group, and we called ourselves the crew. Though Kenji's parents sent him to military school to steer him from the temptations of the street, his exposure to drugs and violence at the academy began to mold him into the criminal he would become. Military school made me a leader, taught me how to organize people into doing things I needed, and learned how to get past authority. I learned that losers make the best soldiers, the same exact way that the U.S. Army and the Marines take. Kenji found the belonging that he craved amongst the other rebellious cadets. He came out of there and then dumped into upper middle class Irvine, ready to raise Holy Home. At age 16, Kenny leaves military school with a formal education in crime. 
Ken's dad was determined to straighten him out. He saw how much trouble he got into at military school. He thought getting him a legitimate job after school would put him on the path of righteousness. He got him a job as a busboy at a restaurant in Costa Mesa, owned by the Avila family. Little did he know that Joe Avila, the owner, and the rest of the guys that went in there were the biggest drug dealers in Orange County at that point in time. The first day when I was waiting outside, the restaurant was closed. Up pulls the owner. This guy, Joe Vila, comes out of his car. This is the early 80s, so he had uh, some pair of slacks on, silk shirt, the glasses. And I was like, wow, who would it be like that guy? Dressed from head to toe in Gucci, private jets. I mean, they owned the world. In the 1980s, most of America's cocaine came from Colombia through Miami. Miami was a capital for cocaine in the 70s. Once there was an increase on the part of law enforcement in Florida, a lot of that moved to the West Coast. By 1984, Southern California became the new cocaine capital. Unmonitored shipping ports and unfettered access to Hollywood made this the perfect base for Colombian cartels. Because of the ability for boats to come in and out all up and down the coast, many of those drug dealers moved to Los Angeles. This was their first stop before being distributed throughout the United States. 16-year-old Kenji found himself at the very epicenter, working as a busboy for the Avila brothers. They didn't worry about Kenny because Kenny wasn't in it for the money with them. He just liked being around them or gave them the impression that's what he wanted. I was supposed to be like a busboy, like dishwasher. And on the second day, one of the guys there lifted up a napkin and he showed me the cocaine. He's like, oh, yeah, here, you can have this as your tip. It turned out to be like an eight ball of Coke. And I think back then, eight ball was about $300. Enamored by the Avila's glamorous lifestyle, Kenji proved himself to the brothers by doing everything he was told, regardless of its implications. Because of his age, Kenji was the perfect, unassuming person to run drugs throughout Orange County. Next thing you know, Ken started bringing in ounces, quarter pounds, half pounds, pounds, kilos, Eventually, the closest members of his crew started breaking it up. He'd give ounces to all of us. He fronted to us. Pure cocaine. Best stuff in the city. We started selling it to everyone we knew, and it spread like wildfire. Everyone did cocaine. And at the time, law enforcement really wasn't equipped. I think I had been pulled over in a car when I had kilos of cocaine in my trunk. They opened the trunk, looked at him, and the Newport Beach PD just let me go. It was three of them and didn't know what they were. And we started making money about 17. I mean, real money. I started telling people, hey, I don't want any fives, tens, and twenties. I need fifties and hundreds. People don't realize, like, fifty grand and twenties is like a huge grocery bag full of money, even if it's abandoned and everything else. I mean, what are you going to do with it? Ken worked his way up from busboy after gaining the Avila's trust to a drug runner to trafficker, leg breaker, till Ken was powerful enough to form his own crew and break away. I was violent all that time, like from 17 on. So I knew how to hurt people. And just a way to instill terror into people and to teach them a lesson. People would try to screw me over and I just decided, well, I'll send them a message. My motivation was to have money and I enjoyed the power that came with the money. You can't have one without the other. Everyone listened to what I'd say. We had plenty of women around all the time. The best times were bouncing around the nightclub. We were the kings then. They loved us because we were palming quarter gram bindles of pure cocaine to everyone we shook hands with. It was a beautiful life. It was all like a movie to us. We knew other people were being murdered around us, but they were all older people. They weren't in our crew. So we had all the guns, the cocaine, the cash, the girls, the nightlife, the glitz, the glamour. It didn't seem real. At a mere 20 years old, Kenji was a recognized player in the cocaine world. But a gangster is always on the make. And in the most unlikely of places, opportunity presents itself. I, I used to work out all the time at a gym. This guy was there, he's tan. Very good looking, handsome guy. He would run in, work out really fast, get pumped up and take off. He told us his name was uh, Al Brown and that he worked for the phone company, which we thought was very strange. And then the next thing I know, one of my friends, Phil, came in. And he goes, oh my god, oh my god, you know who that guy is? And I'm like, yeah, it's Al Brown, the guy who works for a telephone company. He goes, no, 
He's a porn star. He's a porn star Peter North. Ken couldn't resist. He went right up to him and said, Hey, Al, I know what you do for a living. And Al looked at him and smiled and said, Ken, I know what you do for a living. From then on, they became partners. The adult film industry was the perfect place for Kenji to expand his cocaine business. His partnership with Peter North opened new doors for the young criminal. But Kenji was moving into more dangerous territory. The mafia controlled everything, so you didn't do a porno movie in the valley without the mob getting a big cut. Would Kenji's failure to kick up his income to the family be a fatal mistake that nearly ignites a mafia war? <laughs> Barely out of his teens, Kenji Gallo had already lived many lives. Military school, violence, and drugs shaped the young criminal into a cunning businessman. Adult film star Peter North wanted to make his own films and needed Kenji's cash investment to make it happen. This business opportunity leads Kenji one step closer into the life of organized crime. So I had no interest in porn, none at all. And then I saw how easy I could flip this. Here's a business that I could take cash. I could pay every person on the set in cash. I could edit this movie, pay for that cash, sell it for like a big amount of money. All these drug dealers I know, they'll give me cash. I can do this, make a movie, make a profit, lottery the money, and I'm able to raise it because I could have guys come to the set and look at the checks. Kenji had found a way to launder his cocaine money, which led to his introduction to the mafia. Kenny had placed himself in the porn industry. He was fairly successful at it. He was then introduced to this world of mobsters. The mob will try to make a buck wherever it can. I mean, it's staples, basically, gambling and loan sharking, but they'll try to take a piece of uh, anything that moves. Pornography business has always been something that has interested the mob. The cash business, there are a lot of not-so-reputable people involved in it in the first place, and so it's a kind of a business that is ripe for the taking. Kenny had become somewhat of a popular character. If gangsters from New York wanted to go to L.A., Kenny was a point of contact as the guy that could hook you up. He's the guy in the porn industry. The pornography business in L.A. was controlled by the mafia. When they saw Kenji moving in on their territory, they had an associate steal some of Kenji's films to send him a message. But Kenji answered back with a louder one. Some of these mob guys took his master tapes and uh, told him to go f himself. He took a handful of hardcore crips from L.A., and would literally walk into these guys' offices and start beating the shit out of them, putting guns to their faces, and telling them, you better come up with my money, or I'm gonna have these guys hang out in your lobby every single day. The violence from the young upstart surprised the mafia, and Kenji was called into a meeting with Colombo family associate, Jerry Zimmerman. In Kenji, Zimmerman didn't see a problem, Instead, he saw criminal potential and took Kenji under his wing. Jerry Zimmerman taught me scams like how to kite checks, keep the float going. He taught me how to really be a con artist. He's like, you're gonna go to prison forever being the street criminal like you are. He taught me how to polish up my game. We'd have all these business accounts open, and then we'd write checks from different accounts for like twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. I'd put a check in, and then I'd cover it with another bad check. It would just grow and grow and grow. And then finally, we pulled out all the cash out of like a couple of the accounts, and then, boom, there really was no cash. We'd make like a quick fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 or more. As Kenji's reputation grows in the mob, he's introduced to L.A. Mafia capo, Jimmy Kachi. I got introduced to an older guy. His name was Jimmy Kachi. He was a capo in the L.A. family. Jimmy is armed robber, shooter, just is like more my type of guy. Jimmy Kachi, originally from New York, 
was a feared and respected capo in the Los Angeles Mafia. Los Angeles, there were a few more cowboys that came out here from the different families that operated almost independently, still having the backing of the respective families. L.A. is a much smaller venue than New York in terms of the mafia. You have five families in New York. He had one in Los Angeles. You know, Jimmy's a capo in the L.A. family. He's like, one day you want to take a ride with me, and I started doing stuff with them. Jimmy Cacci told me at that point, no, no facial hair, you got to cut your hair, because I had, like, longer hair by then. And he's like, you got to cut your hair, you got to dress nicer. I went from, like, the doper 80s into this new 90s type thing. Under Jimmy Cacci, Kenji moved up from the school of drug dealing and began his formal education in the world of organized crime. Jimmy taught me a lot about organized crime and Cosa Nostra, the, the lifestyle. Uh, he taught me, like, how to act, how to dress, how to be respectful to people. Like, he grew me for that next step up where I needed to be. Being involved with the Mafia or the Cosa Nostra, it's like a, being in a minefield. You kind of got to walk in between it. As Kenji's reputation with the West Coast Mafia grows, his reputation with women grew as well. And of course, he came into contact with these big porn stars, and he actually dated a lot of them. He dated Savannah Smiles. He ended up dating Amber Lynn, who at the time was the top porn star in the world. And then he eventually met Tabitha Stevens, who was one of the top porn stars. The first time I met Kenny was on a set. I was doing a movie for his company. Kenny was a gentleman. Kenny seemed to have himself put together very well. Kenny was very smart. Kenny was very sure of himself. And that was kind of an attraction, I think. We were both young. I liked her. She said, hey, let's get married. I said, cool, let's do it. it. Wasn't a good idea on either of our parts. I married a porn star. She married a criminal. When you're in my business, it's hard to find somebody that's going to be attracted to you for who you are, not exactly what your job is. And Kenny was that person. Kenji's short-lived marriage to Tabitha opened up a new frontier for him. Las Vegas. Regular visits to Vegas to visit Tabitha's family placed Kenji in proximity to the notorious criminal world of the Vegas Strip, just in time for a shocking mob hit. There was a murder that happened in Vegas. It was the Herbie Blitzstein murder. I remember we heard it on the news that this guy had been killed, and Kenny was in shock. In 1997, Herbie Blitzstein, a Vegas mob icon, was executed with three shots to the back of the head. The press called this a mob murder, and the FBI opened their investigation. Blitzstein was in the process of fighting his nomination to the Black Book when he was murdered. Over a dozen mob associates in Las Vegas became suspects. Because of his connections with both L.A. and Las Vegas and his deep-seated roots within the drug trade and pornography industry, Kenji stood out. Although he ultimately wasn't implicated in the murder, the FBI was now introduced to Kenji Gallo. The feds had an operation going in Vegas, which I didn't know about. They were trying to get guys that were in the LCN, the Mafia, that were in Vegas and in California. As the weeks passed, the FBI was hot on Kenji's trail. I was with my wife, and her grandmother called her, and she said, the FBI had just left my house. The FBI wanted Kenji. And so I'm like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. This is big trouble for me. Kenji had two choices. Would he run, or would he make a deal with the FBI? By the late 90s, Kenji's life was on a criminal fast track. Part-time porn producer and full-time Los Angeles Mafia associate. But after the Herbie Blitzstein murder and the feds turning up the heat in Vegas, Kenji starts to feel the FBI on his heels. I was with my wife, and her grandmother called her. Asking to talk to Kenny, which was weird. And so I'm like, oh, man, I'm in trouble. This is big trouble for me. Kenji decides to talk with the FBI. They choose a diner by the highway for their first meeting. 
So I figured I'm getting arrested for something. I have no idea what. So I gave my wife everything. I just wore a pair of sweats there because I figured if I'm going to go, I might as well be warm. When I walk in, he says, do you have any weapons on you? I'm like, no, I'm wearing sweats. I didn't even got anything in my pocket. He just checked me real quick. He's like, okay, don't freak out. And I walk in through there and I turn this corner into this like private part of the thing and there was an agent sitting in there. Unknown to Kenji, the FBI had been tracking him for months. I was like, okay, you guys can arrest me now. He's like, oh, we don't arrest you. He's like, you know, you got it for your insurance fraud. It's mail fraud. They uncovered one of Kenji's street scams, car insurance fraud. The FBI had him where they wanted him. But he goes, I'm going to tell you something. You get off on this, but we're going to get you for like Rico. You're going to get killed. Kenji's life with the mafia had caught up to him. The FBI gave him two choices, face charges and go to jail, or wear a wire, collect information on the mafia, and walk away. That is an issue with the general public, even with some in law enforcement, as to why are we giving this guy a pass? Why are we giving him this get out of jail card in order to get someone else? In order for us as law enforcement to do our job, sometimes we have to make deals with the devil. I think Kenny knew before he even went and sat down with the Bureau that he was going to cooperate. He realized pretty quick that these mobsters were nothing more than greedy, murderous people who did look out for each other. There was no code. There was no glamorous life. Kenji had a decision to make, become a cooperating witness or take his chances with the FBI watching his every move. I was headed down a path where I would be killed or I'd be in prison for RICO for the rest of my life. The whole life of organized criminal, everything was a waste because everything I built up, everything that I did was built on sand. It was just gone away. It was a complete waste of my life. Kenji's life has turned 180 degrees from a mafia associate to a rat for the FBI. And now there are new rules to play by. There is that very thin line and you have to be so careful that you don't cross it. That's the most difficult thing, because you know that virtually every word you're saying is being recorded. Everything you're doing is probably going to go to court. When I first started wearing a wire, I used to wrap it up with my money and then put a rubber band around it. Sometimes I keep it in my pocket. No one ever checked me, so it didn't matter. Kenji embraced his role as a cooperating witness, but he didn't think he was being used to his full capacity. I had had conversations with Kenny where he had complained that he had information for multi-kilo narcotics traffickers. His handlers weren't interested. Kenny wanted to run 24-7, and quite often he was being held back by his handlers. Couldn't possibly do all the things that Kenny wanted to do. There really was that adrenaline addiction. There was a rush to working undercover. I think most of the informants that I worked with enjoyed that thrill. They got involved in criminal activity because of the thrill and they were still allowed to maintain their involvement, only this time they were on this side of the law. It took a lot of nerve to do what Kenny did. I mean, to put a wire on and go into somebody's house or into a nightclub is a very dangerous thing. You could be killed. Kenny seemed to be the type of guy that could just turn that fear off and go in, take care of business, and come out unscathed. It wasn't long before Kenji's West Coast handlers had other plans for their star rat on the East Coast. Given Kenji Gallo's LA mob connections, he'd be the perfect cooperating witness to infiltrate the New York mob. I wanted to move up and come to Brooklyn and go to the heart of where this is, and I wanted to be with a real family. With some connections already established with the Colombo family, Kenji was able to make the move from California to New York. But Brooklyn was not Orange County, California. In Brooklyn, Kenji would begin leading his double life. But where would his loyalty lie? After living most of his life as an L.A. mob associate, Kenji Gallo now works for the other side. He flipped. He's a cooperating witness. He's a rat. By wearing a wire and recording his conversations with associates, Kenji helps to gather evidence and information on mobsters. Kenji is also getting good at it. 
I decided I needed to get to New York permanently. And I was already meeting with Colombo family guys and guys from Bay Ridge, like street guys. So I already knew I had a place here. He jumped in, it was like a duck to water. He felt very comfortable there. The feds had Kenji use his established contacts to infiltrate the New York family he knows best, the Columbos. For more than 100 years, there have been five major crime families, the five families that have controlled the mob activities you know, in the New York metropolitan area. The Genovese crime family, the Gambino crime family, the Bonanno crime family, the Lucchese crime family, and the Colombo crime family. The Colombo crime family, for more than 20 years, has been headed by Carmine Persico, the godfather of the crime family. All the Persicos have a reputation for violence. Ken became very close with the Persicos, probably the most psychopathic, murderous, bloodthirsty family in the history of the mob. And that's certainly saying a lot. Now, Kenji is playing for the other side. In the war between the FBI and the five mafia families of New York, Kenji is the newest weapon, armed not with a gun or a knife, but with a wire hidden in his pocket. It didn't take long for Kenji to fit right in with New York. His first piece of work for his new mobster friends involved the release of Colombo Capo, Teddy Persico Jr. Because this is the most important thing you're ever gonna do. What am I gonna do? Because I've done a lot of things, but how important is this? He's like, listen, Teddy's getting out of prison in two days, and we gotta arrange a limo ride for him back. And I'm like, that's it? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, but you can't tell anyone about this. And I'm like, I'm not gonna tell anyone. But Kenji does tell the FBI, and the name Teddy Persico Jr. strikes a chord. Teddy Persico Jr. is the nephew of the boss of the crime family, Carmine Persico. Teddy Jr. early on established himself as a moneymaker for the crime family. He was convicted of drug dealing back in the 1980s. During the 16, 17 years he actually was serving his time, He's said to have controlled a lot of the drug dealing that the Colombo crime family was still involved in. The Colombos want Kenji to use his porn connections to arrange for a welcome back gift for Teddy on the day of his release from prison. You need to get escorts for the ride back from Greenhaven State Penitentiary for Teddy. And I said, all right. They want it to be perfect for Teddy. We're going to give you a garbage bag that has to be in the limousine. And in the garbage bag is a track suit, $1,000 cash, a cell phone, and a watch for Teddy. They give me the garbage bag. They finally dropped me off at like right after 12. So I opened that bag and I took the cell phone out and I went for a jog. The FBI had secretly prearranged a spot for Kenji to hand off the Persico cell phone. While Kenji jogs through the empty streets, the FBI rig a wiretap. Then the switch is made and the trap is set. So I got that phone back. I put it back in the bag. Uh, the limousine went to pick up Teddy. Teddy Persico is getting out of jail after 16 or so years in prison. He walks out of the joint, and he's met by this limousine that's filled with booze, and this porn star hooker is there waiting for him, and she ends up giving him a cell phone. Teddy gets out after like being in there 17 years. He's never seen a cell phone, doesn't know how to program this. He puts on his white sneakers, his tracksuit. As soon as Teddy Persico got out of jail and got into that car, he was dead to rights five minutes into the ride, telling Kenny that, you know, I'm gonna be taking over soon. He didn't make it back to his house before they already had this guy committing criminal activity on the way home from jail. Kenji's wiring of Persico had already successfully implicated him in a crime. But the FBI had much bigger plans for bringing him down. They wanted Kenji to befriend the Colombo Capo to get something they knew would finally put him away for good. But now, Teddy is back on the street and has to watch his every step. The feds love to make cases against mob figures. They love the big names. The name, you know, in my opinion, killed them that Persico name. Teddy Persico Jr. was the nephew of Colombo boss Carmine Persico Jr., also known as Carmine the Snake. The Persicos had run the Colombo crime family since the early 1970s. Teddy is a magnet for trouble. 
Plus, Teddy was locked up for, you know, 17 years. Mentally, he's still 23 or 24 years old. He wants to go out to the club, a bunch of guys around him. He's perfect for what the FBI wants. Teddy Persico Jr. was a loose cannon, and he felt he could make up for lost time by violently demanding respect. Teddy Persico was threatening people. He told me one day he needs to leave a body in the street so people will respect him, and he's getting out of control. Confiding in Kenji, Teddy asked if he was getting what he really deserved. He asked me, do you think I'm getting ripped off? Kenji's advice would lead to his unraveling within the Colombo family. Would his life as a mafia associate come to an end? Kenji had successfully infiltrated the Colombo crime family and gained the respect of Teddy Persico Jr. while wearing a wire for the FBI. But Kenji had grown tired of his life undercover. To him, it was just a game. I really hated my life and I was over it. I think he had a death wish between me and you because uh, this kid was just talking very freely about some very serious people. Kenji started trouble within the family by convincing Teddy that other associates were getting the money that he deserved. By goading Teddy, he'd either be pulled out by the FBI or taken out by the mob. He asked me, do you think I'm getting ripped off? So I said to him, listen, Teddy, you live in an apartment. He said, yeah, but it's nice. I'm like, it's rented. How many houses do you have? And he goes, none. I'm like, everyone else has houses. And he's like, well, I got a Mercedes. I'm like, no, no, they leased you a Mercedes. And then he says, well, I got the trekking company. And I'm like, do you? Kenji convinced Teddy he was being disrespected, not receiving his proper share. Manny Garofalo did not appreciate this unsolicited advice. Manny Garofalo is a Colombo family associate who Kenji became close to. The Garofalos have been involved in the construction industry for years, and Kenji was able to give the feds a little bit of a special insight into their activities as well. He's not a made guy, but he had a lot of power and he knew a lot of guys. Manny provided kickbacks to Teddy, who was his capo. He didn't appreciate Kenji speaking to Teddy behind his back about redistributing the family's income. Manny was upset and called Kenji in for a private sit-down. When I get to the diner, it's like the closed off section. Not a good sign. So I sit down with him, and he goes, I got to talk to you. And I said, okay, what? And he goes, what did you tell Teddy? I need to know what you told Teddy. And I said, I'm not telling you anything. So he says, we have to go to Staten Island. We have to go to the truck yard right now, and we got to speak to Teddy. And I'm like, I'm not going to Staten Island ever. Kenji wanted to leave the life, even if it meant getting caught as a rat and killed. He was desperate. He just wanted out. And I go, you know what? This meeting is going nowhere. I'm getting up. I didn't tell you to get up, and I'm like, see ya. So I start to walk outside, and he's like yelling behind me. We're gonna go talk to Teddy. And I'm not going with you. My heart was beating fast. I'm like, I just gotta get to my car. Because I got a gun, I need my seat in my car. The FBI told me no violence, but you know what? It's easy to say, because those guys have guns, they got badges, they got a backup. Unlike movies, when you're an informant, there is no backup. There's no wire that leads at the FBI. There's nothing. I'm on my own, and especially like this, the FBI really basically only works nine to five, and they were already off this day. I opened the door, and I reached in. Once I had that in there, man, I knew I was gonna be safe. I climbed up into my car, and he was screaming something, and I'm like, I'm in my truck. Anyone tries to stop me now, I'm just running him over. I get on the Belt Parkway, and I'm just like, man, anyone tries to stop me, it's over. Kenji had been running his mouth. Manny couldn't trust him anymore and began to have suspicions about who this kid from California really was. Just a hint of suspicion could get you killed. Could Kenji Gallo be a rat?
It's very dangerous out there. And if they even think that you're a rat, it could be a life-threatening or a deadly situation. If they had caught him being involved uh, as an informant, his life was in danger, there's no question about it. In his worst nightmares, Kenji would be executed by the river like other rats before him. Teddy had heard Manny's claims about Kenji's allegiance, but decided to test Manny's theory. So he told Kenji he planned to get rid of Craig Marino, a Colombo soldier. Craig became a made guy in the Colombo family, loved the life, loved to be in the social clubs and play cards, and he loved being what he was. He enjoyed it. Teddy had a beef with Marino stemming from the Colombo War. For two years, there was a Colombo War between rival factions of the Colombo crime family for the leadership of the crime family. Twelve people died, including ten rival gangsters and two bystanders who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when the shooting broke out. Knowing that a cooperating witness cannot commit an act of violence, Teddy orders Kenji to participate in the hit of Craig Marino. The main thing that they always instill in my head when I'm working for them was no violence. Absolutely, under no circumstances am I to commit any violent act. So I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? I can't leave. I'm going to get shot. Teddy told me, get in the car. We're going to go for a ride. He tells me, we're going to take care of Craig. You got a problem with that? And I said, no, I don't got a problem with that because, you know, I know what my answer has got to be. Even though I like Craig, and I have no beef with Craig, Teddy's staring at me and he's saying, we have to deal with this problem. And I said, okay. He calls his brother and he goes, you call up Craig and you tell him I want him down by my mother's house right now. I want to see him now. He needs to come in. And then he calls his other brother up and he goes, I need my gear. Bring the gear. Come by mom's house. Before he knew it, Kenji found himself on the way to a hit. But I'm thinking in my mind, I've got the wire running, but there's no way I can get anywhere and call the FBI. Caught between disobeying the FBI by committing murder or betraying the Columbos, this will be the final test in Kenji's double life. Basically, the misconception about the mob is people think they're going to come into a place with their machine guns blazing. In real life, they get your best friend to lure you somewhere, and they shoot you in the back of the head. They get someone that you trust. While wearing a wire, Kenji is brought along by Teddy Persico Jr. to murder a rival Colombo member, Craig Marino. That's what it is. It's a bunch of guys killing their best friends. And that's it. Kenji knows he can't participate in this murder. But if he doesn't, he'll be killed. This will once and for all solve the question. Is Kenji Gallo a cooperating witness? Is he a rat? But I'm thinking in my mind, I've got the wire running. But there's no way I can get anywhere and call the FBI. The main thing that they always instill in my head when I'm working for them was no violence. Absolutely no violence. So I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? I can't leave. I'm going to get shot. As they park the car and get into place, Teddy notices a nearby police car. There's a cop car next door. Knowing that if they go through with the hit, they will be spending the rest of their lives in prison. Teddy calls it off. And I see Teddy's brother. So I run over there, and I tell him, it's off. Teddy told you guys to go home. 
Get out of here. Cops are here. Craig Marino had dodged a bullet. However, the FBI had enough information to eventually bring down Teddy Persico Jr. But because the hit never took place, Kenji's loyalty was still in question. If he stayed in Brooklyn, he would be forced to kill or be killed. The streets of Brooklyn were no longer safe for Kenji Gallo. The next morning, the FBI calls me, and they're like, OK, you're done. You're not going back to New York. I'm over this whole thing. I don't like Manny. I'm done with Teddy. I hate Craig. I'm done with Brooklyn. And I really want this thing to end. This thing with the FBI has gone on too long. No longer safe in Brooklyn, Kenji is pulled from New York and hidden in Toronto, Canada, before being debriefed and sent to a safe house. Kenji had fulfilled his obligation to the FBI. Kenny wore a wire for approximately eight years. To keep an informant out on the street eight years without detection from other members of organized crime, without being suspect, is amazing. There really was that adrenaline addiction. There was a rush to working undercover, posing as one of them, being one of them. There was no greater thrill than to walk away from a meeting knowing that you had convinced them that you were one of them. At first, I was like really sad. Like I wanted to go back to Brooklyn. I felt like I still wanted to be part of that life. Like I was missing something. Even though I did this to myself, I did it on my own. I made it blow up on purpose. I was like a drug. I was addicted to Cosa Nostra, to the mafia. Kenji only spent one year in the witness relocation program before he decided to return to where it all began, in Orange County, California. My life today is good. I live a really good life. I live a legitimate life. I do legitimate business. Today, Kenji lives an honest life as a passionate mixed martial arts fighter. I just try to do good. I try to keep a positive attitude. I try to talk to people now about what I did and try to tell them that the whole life is a waste. I wasted 20 years. He chose this life of crime because of the excitement, glamour, power. And I think after 20 years of life on the streets, the danger, and the deaths around him, I think they carried a heavy toll on him. They regret the whole life. They worked at any job, I would be successful. Instead, I pissed away all the money, gave it to a bunch of old men, kicked it out for no reason. It's just, it was all a waste. It's a big waste. I don't know if Kenny's life is in danger. I don't know who he's put in jail. I don't know what he's done. But obviously, if he's out of the witness protection program, he's not afraid. He's not scared. I think there's a lot of people that uh, want Ken dead. They would probably shoot him on sight, but if they shot him and missed, Ken would come after them and they have a whole different ballgame on their hands. But it's nothing to like rejoice and everything else. And all these other guys want to play big man. I'm just me. I'm just here. I'm doing what I got to do. That's it.